talk shows welcome to the open university of the airwaves with george galloway as the german statesman metternich said when told of the unexpected death of his french rival talleyrand dead i wonder what he meant by that did prigozhin fall from an extremely high window or was it a terrorist assassination? And why did the United States evacuate all of its nationals from Belarus, the base of Prigozhin and Wagner over the last few days? And on the anniversary on this day in 1942 of the joining of the epic and crucial Battle of Stalingrad, we'll be asking if it was true what Marshal Zhukov said, we have crushed Hitler and Nazism, our allies will never forgive us. That and the BRICS all coming up over the next two hours. Stay tuned for what will be, I promise, the mother of all talk shows. Curious about our curriculum? Have something to say? Then call us now to join the debate on the mother of all talk shows. The only education you can get for free. George Galloway. The mother of all talk shows. With George Galloway, the world is our classroom. And you're welcome to sit in and join the seminar. What Metternich meant, of course, was that no one as cunning and mysterious and genius like Talleyrand could possibly have died without it having any deeper meaning. Tonight we'll be asking if the strange and unexpected death plummeting from the skies on a private aircraft on a flight from Moscow to St. Petersburg has some deeper meaning. Of course, a great deal of speculation will center around the famous statement by President Putin in 2018 that he could forgive most anything except betrayal. We can recall the statement by the same President Putin that those who led just two months ago the so-called march on Moscow had done an act of treason and that they would be dealt with. Of course, many will imagine that this all proves the long hand of President Putin. But you'll not be surprised, perhaps, to learn that in this case, at least, I don't think so. For a start, it blows a hole in Russia's opportunity to gain from the turmoil in Niger, where I assume the last video appearance of Prigozhin was filmed. The Wagner Group is very important, not just in Niger, but in Burkina Faso and also in Mali. It is also fighting ISIS and Al-Qaeda terrorists in other parts of Africa. Now they may continue to do that without their head, but the plane that blew up over Moscow today also had his deputy, Utkin, in the plane beside him. So Wagner just lost their leader and their deputy leader and blowing away perhaps the possibility of a decisive role in a big crisis in Africa where US and French imperialism was seeking to reverse the coup in Niger. The second reason why I don't think so is the BRICS. This is a gathering of immense importance to Russia. 
in Africa, in South Africa. Putin himself just delivered the address he could not make in person by video hours before the events surrounding the plane crash between Moscow and St. Petersburg. It's an embarrassment for Russia, whether Putin had him killed or whether someone else successfully assassinated him, which is the theory to which I myself, in events that are only an hour or two old, am beginning to lean. I'll tell you why. There are far more unspectacular ways of killing Prigozhin than blowing him out of the sky with the death of nine or let's call it eight others, three pilots, other passengers. If he flew out from a Moscow airport, he could have been killed in the Moscow airport with one bullet or one whiff of Novichok. He could have been dispensed with very cleanly, with no collateral damage, and in a way which would have drawn far less international interest. The second reason is this, that the United States, just 72 hours ago, and apropos apparently nothing at all, withdrew all of its nationals from Belarus, who was based in Belarus, who was living in Belarus, who had recently established a camp in Belarus, none other than Prigozhin and his Wagner group. Now, I'm not suggesting for one minute that there's no valid reason to suspect the hand of Putin seeking revenge for what happened a couple of months ago. I'm just asking you to balance the probabilities. And when I do that, at this early stage, my finger of suspicion points towards a political assassination. The United States is not the only party that could have a an opportunity could have a motive for carrying out this assassination. France is another. After the events in Niger and the importance of Prigozhin in African struggles, France would be a potential culprit. But the United States must have known that something was going to happen to Prigozhin unless they can come up with another explanation as to why their nationals were suddenly pulled out of Belarus with no explanation and no other theory occurring to me or anyone else at this point in time. Either way, it's an embarrassment to Russia. If someone can get explosives, a bomb onto a plane, at a Moscow airport and kill not just the leader and the deputy leader of the Wagner private military company, that is a black eye, to say the least, for Russia. If Russia themselves killed Prigozhin, well, no doubt it will have a chilling effect on anyone else who in the middle of a war decides to lead a mutiny against the government in Moscow. But as I say, there were easier ways and better times to have carried out that revenge. If I remember correctly, uh, the, uh, the events in Salisbury, the Scripple affair, occurred at an equally odd time for a Russian leader to carry out an act that could only bring opprobrium on himself and on his country. So a pattern may very well be developing here. As the story develops, tonight and again on Sunday, I'm sure, we will keep you abreast of it and invite calls and guests with different perspectives on those events. 
But I want to turn to the epic battle which was joined on this day in 1942, the Battle of Stalingrad. I do so because many younger viewers know little of its importance, little of its epic scale. It was the biggest battle in all human history, and it had the most important outcome in all human history. Because the Red Army victory at Stalingrad quickly followed by the decisive victory of the Red Army and its T-34 tank divisions of the Nazi forces at Kursk marked the turn in the Second World War that led very quickly thereafter to the crushing of Hitler in his lair and the defeat of Hitler fascism amidst the ruins of Berlin. Kursk, incidentally, was won exactly 80 years ago this day, an auspicious anniversary for both of those reasons. But the defeat of Hitler fascism, overwhelmingly as a result of the heroism and professionalism and the leadership of the Red Army was something that the West never forgave as the victor of the battle for Berlin. Marshal Zhukov said, predicted so presciently at that time, we have destroyed Hitler and Nazism. Our allies will never forgive us. How significant a prediction that turned out to be. Because although the Red Army broke the siege of Stalingrad and decisively crushed von Paulus and the beasts of fascism that had besieged the city and caused such slaughter, the truth is Russia has been besieged ever since. It was besieged immediately that the victory was won in Berlin. The Iron Curtain was not erected by the Russians. It was erected by those who actually had a plan to turn the Nazi divisions around and lead them into a war against the then Soviet Union. And the author of that plan was the British Prime Minister Winston Churchill. The Cold War was begun not by Russia, but by the West. NATO was formed not as a response to the creation of the Warsaw Pact, but four years before the creation of the Warsaw Pact. The fact that I'm having to spell out these once upon a time ABCs to any audience, even this one, is a sign of the extent to which the history of the Second World War and its aftermath have been so utterly distorted that 70% of French people believe that it was the United States that won the Second World War. 70% of French, the most politically advanced population in Europe, think that it was the GIs that defeated Hitler and liberated Germany from fascist tyranny. The siege of Russia was made possible by the now, in retrospect, foolhardiness of Stalin in not destroying the German state when he was able to do so. I mentioned Metternich earlier. Bismarck united all of the principalities of Germany 
and created a mighty military power out of it, which danced in the streets of Paris on two occasions subsequently. Germany invaded and conquered France three times in 70 years. The case for returning Germany to a balkanized set of principalities was no doubt made in the Kremlin, but not agreed upon. They settled instead for a line east of which when Russia agreed to abandon that line, NATO would never advance according to the promises of George Bush the first and all of the presidents and secretaries of state until Bill Clinton began the super expansion of NATO during his presidency. But it would not have been possible if the German state had been broken up as it is now clear it should have been. And now Russia again has panzers on its territory, not all that far from Kursk. Why do I dwell on this? Not just because it's an important history lesson, but because I'm thinking that no such moderation no such reasonableness will ever again win the day in arguments in the Kremlin. Dividing Ukraine along the Dnipro, along the current line of control, freezing the conflict on a North-South Korea basis would only bring, would only be a harbinger of great disasters to come. A division of Ukraine into East Ukraine and West Ukraine, with West Ukraine becoming bristling with weapons, including nuclear weapons, would only move the front line. A much more radical outcome of the war in Ukraine, it seems to me, is much more likely and i'll be discussing that with my guests in the rest of the show but let me turn quickly to the united states of america where this evening donald trump and tucker carlson go head to head with fox news's so-called debate between the runners in the donkey derby who are the opponents of President Trump in this contest. I'm sure, as you are, that Tucker and Trump will win the day, the ratings war. In fact, it will be no contest by an entire furlong. These two thoroughbreds will trounce the opposition in the donkey derby. But that's not my point. If you have not yet seen the interview between Tucker Carlson and Colonel Douglas McGregor, whom you saw first here on the mother of all talk shows, and more than once, then you have missed the most important interview that you may ever watch in your entire lifetime, unless the lesson of that interview is learned and heeded and acted on quickly. Colonel McGregor's tour de force and Tucker's monologue about how this war in Ukraine has been the big lie, a big lie of which Goebbels himself would have been proud. All these lies have led to the deaths of hundreds of thousands of men, most of them by a ratio of five to one Ukrainian men, the flower of the Ukrainian people, 
now laid in the ground in the service of that big lie. Colonel McGregor, a combat veteran, an officer and a gentleman, a former White House and Pentagon advisor, lays bare the extent of that big lie. And I really hope that once you've watched this mother of all talk shows tonight, and once you've watched Carlson and Trump, that you don't miss out and watch Carlson and Colonel McGregor, the most important interview you may ever watch. Fasten your seatbelts. It's going to be a bumpy night. It is already the mother of all talk shows. The airwaves. This savannah is a rigid dictotomy of fact and fiction. As vicious as the Twitter sphere where the slightest misjudgment can spell being cancelled. One species rules over the airwaves through its ability to adapt and survive in even the harshest environments. George Galloway. The top cat in these parts, it is mostly active on Sunday evenings in Britain and mid-afternoon in the United States. It seldom roars during the day. Most notable for its wide variety of headdress, it protects these parts from the mainstream media. You can catch this fine specimen on the mother of all talk shows. Don't pick a fight with it. They've been known to bite back. You are listening to the mother of all talk shows with George Galloway. Now, uh, we're running a poll this evening on Hawaii, on Maui, the disaster-stricken area, which has been treated so bizarrely by President Joe Biden, who went on two holidays, who said no comment to the media on the subject of the wildfires there on two occasions, two holidays, two no comments, and then went to Hawaii and promptly fell asleep as a sign of how dynamic the presidential response was, raising this question that we pose this evening. Should disaster-stricken Hawaii secede from the United States? Although, as my friend Mark Seddon pointed out, that presupposes that the people of Hawaii ever agreed to join the United States in the first place. Should disaster-stricken Hawaii secede from the United States? The answers, yes or no, on my Telegram channel, t.me forward slash George Galloway, on my Twitter, my X, on the YouTube community poll, and on the YouTube stream, 17,000 people have already voted in this poll. Have your say. Should Hawaii leave the United States of America? If you have any comment to make on anything I've said or should have said, here are the numbers in the UK and Ireland. Remember, it's entirely free of charge. 0808196552. That's 0808196552. In the US and Canada, again, entirely toll free, it's plus one eight four four nine four four double three double four. That's plus one eight four four nine four four double three double four. And if you're in the rest of the world, it's four four two zero three nine double six two six two five. Four four two zero three nine double six 
2625. Now, my first guest this evening, I was asked about an hour ago, uh, where does Pepe Escobar live? Where is he based? I answered, I have no idea. All I know is he knows everything about everywhere. And that's why he's such a supremely interesting guest to join us on the mother of all talk shows this evening. And I mean it sincerely, Pepe. Now, I asked you on here to talk about the BRICS, and I promise that we shall. But I need to ask what you make of the events in Russia this afternoon and the presumed death of both the leader and the deputy leader of the Wagner Group. Wow, George, first of all, it's an enormous pleasure to talk to you and to your audience, of course. It's an explosive night here in Moscow. It's 11.30 p.m., and rumors have been swirling all over the spectrum for hours, in fact. It's confirmed. Uh, Yevgeny Prigozhin and his number two, his aide-de-camp, uh, Dmitry Utkin, uh, they, are, they, they are dead. They are confirmed dead. Uh, it, it has not been announced by uh, Russia 24 TV officially, but it has been confirmed by Wagner. Not only that, uh, the you know the top honchos at, at Wagner are, as we speak, sitting down to put in place the contingency plans that they, of course, they had for for years. In fact, in case of the death of their CEO, uh, it's it's a completely crazy situation in Moscow because there are all sorts of rumors and explanations and hypotheses concerning. Who killed Prigozhin? The CIA, the NSA, Putin, Shoigu, Gerasimov, uh, <laughs> the SBU, you name it. You know, uh, We don't know anything. We, uh, one of the f- only things that we really know is that the plane um, uh, was shot down. We don't know by whom. Uh, there's a lot of speculation that uh, Russian... Uh, anti-aircraft system did it, Uh, an S-300, not confirmed at all. Apparently, there was not a bomb on board. So uh, uh, you can imagine what's going to happen in the next uh, 24 to 48 hours, right? And uh, of course, uh, this will not, that's very, very important. It's not going to change what Wagner is going to do in Africa. Very important. Prigozhin flew from Africa. Today, he arrived in Moscow, and then they took uh, this Embraer plane to go to St. Petersburg. And then the accident or crash, whatever you want to call, happened. The thing is, uh, what Prigozhin had already announced in early May, this means a month, a month and a half before that extraordinary Maskirovka that happened in June 23, 24, the, the so-called coup against Putin which was not a coup, was basically a, a union dispute between um, Prigozhin and uh, Shoigu at the Ministry of Defense. So uh, Prigozhin himself had already announced that uh, Wagner was going to be reorganized in Africa or solidified in Africa as a sort of international body against uh, all sorts of Al-Qaeda-inspired or al qaeda Uh, linked terror outfits operating in Africa in the famous tri-border area. This means Mali, Burkina Faso, and Niger. So this is not going to change. This is the the plan, short, middle, and long term for Wagner. And this is directly linked to the Russian Ministry of Defense as well. So what's already happening, which is extraordinary, tonight, in fact, a lot of Wagner uh, fighters who were in Belarus are flying back to Russia and they're going to be directly incorporated into the Ministry of Defense. So whatever happened to Prigozhin, we can say one thing. Uh, the Prigozhin chapter, which is a sort of a <laughs> 10 Netflix series in one, especially these past few months, is over. But Wagner, incorporated in the Ministry of Defense and acting as a very, very strong force in in the Sahel, in Africa, it's a given. 
What happened to Prigozhin, we'll only know in the next, uh, I would say, days, not hours. It's very, it's very, very complicated. And uh, considering that, uh, I'll, I'll give an example. There are two Telegram channels that are linked to Wagner that they are saying that the plane was shot down by a missile operated by the Russian Minister of Defense. This is an extremely serious allegation with no proof, of course. It could have been a rogue operation, of course. It could have been something that rogue operators linked to the Ministry of Defense managed to get away with it because they had support from above. And considering that the feud between uh, Prigozhin and Shoigu was something really, really hardcore, which is something that was confirmed personally to me by a Donbass commander who turned politician here in Moscow and said, yes, it's, it's personal. Between Prigozhin and Shoigu, Shoigu, it's personal. So this whole story was basically a clash of egos, and now more or less, it's more or less resolved, at least for the moment. Can the orchestra, though, uh, play as well uh, without its conductor and his deputy? Uh, are these musicians capable of operating under new management? And what's the argument for having such a mercenary force in any case. I, from the beginning, have said that it's, it's an extremely unhealthy growth uh, on the Russian body politic, that the state has to have a monopoly of that level of force, uh, drawing my inspiration from Machiavelli's uh, same conclusion. Uh, shouldn't they just forget about Wagner now and everyone join the army? In fact, uh, George, they will forget about Wagner because Wagner will be renamed and will be incorporated uh, into the Russian Ministry of Defense. So Wagner, as we know, it will continue, but under new, very, very special management. This means directly the Ministry of Defense. But the mandate and what they are supposed to do across Africa is not going to change. The same thing, it, it's what they did in Syria. They're going to replicate and they're already replicating in Africa. And the Belarus chapter was a diversion, considering what happened these past few months where they uh, were threatening more or less to open uh, a new front against um, uh, Ukraine. And that drove the SBU and Ukrainian intelligence completely crazy. But that was a Maskirovka as well. Uh, th there was never any intention by Wagner and by the Minister of Defense to have Wagner operating inside Belarus. The focus is Africa. And, and now, after what happened, what what is still happening in Niger, which is the culmination of a long process of uh, revolt against uh, France Afrique, the French system in West Africa, and all shapes and <laughs> and forms of French neo-colonialism, the Russians have a great opportunity to have a, a sort of. Uh, anti-terror and anti-foreign interference um, outfit operating from Western Africa all the way to Eastern Africa sooner, sooner or later across the Sahel. Let's say a belt from uh, uh, Mali all the way to uh, Eritrea, for instance, against, of course, the usual suspects and French influence. So, so this is what's going to be played out in Africa and next. And of course, the, the usual suspects uh, in the Pentagon, the Beltway, are absolutely terrified about it. Now, I made the point earlier that one of the reasons why uh, this would be an odd day uh, for uh, Putin to decide to kill Prigozhin was that this was a red letter day uh, for uh, BRICS, which is, of course, built upon, in part, uh, Russia's prestige, strength, and, and uh, advancing uh, economy, and so on. And indeed, this was the very day that Putin addressed 
the BRICS. Now, you've been uh, very excited about this BRICS summit. Why not? Uh, has it lived up uh, to your expectations so far? Yes. Uh, not yet. To, to answer you directly, George, not yet. Uh, in fact, this morning, all of us were following closely the speeches by the five leaders. Uh, okay, um, concisely, I would say that Putin and Xi uh, basically delivered. Uh, they are both extremely aware of the ultra high stakes involved. But uh, from Modi, from Lula, and from uh, Ramaphosa, I would say was not exactly exciting. Modi, basically, he had a campaign speech. He was basically saying, look how, how great I am, oh, everything that I accomplished in India this past year or year and a half or two years. Lula was, uh, was not the Lula that we're used to. He can be an absolutely outstanding speaker when he improvises. He was reading notes, and obviously these notes were not written by him. This is something we can tell right away. Even the way he speaks his Portuguese, you can tell right away that these this is not Lula thinking and this is not Lula arguing, you know. So uh, he was below par considering his very, very high standards as a public speaker. And Ramaphosa was basically taking notes and basically repeating uh, slogans that we are all familiar with, but um, without elaborating on them. Pra praising his colleagues for some of the things they said, of course, but they had already discussed that uh, among themselves. So they knew exactly uh, if they were in sync, and they are in sync about most of it, in terms of uh, BRICS as uh, a sort of new G7, or the real G20 from now on, or even an alternate alternative United Nations, or uh, the most important multilateral organization at the moment to organize the inclusion of the global south and in international relations, uh, the reach towards Africa, which is very, very important. The Chinese have been saying that for years, in fact. And uh, it's no wonder that Xi Jinping tomorrow is going to have a meeting. Only China and 40 or 50 heads of states from all over Africa and also from the G77, which is the non aligned, the new non aligned movement, which, by the way, George, the G77 is now G134. There are 134 developing nations on this group, on this non aligned group, which is basically the cream of the crop of the global south. And they are all interested in BRICS, and they're all interested in discussing with BRICS, and they're all interested to have some of their members as part of BRICS. Which brings us to who is going to be part of BRICS Plus, which is something that they said, the South Africans said today, it's going to be announced tomorrow. Uh, there are two conflicting versions coming from the South African themselves. They're going to announce tomorrow the procedures for the new members of BRICS Plus. And there's another interpretation that they already have a list. What we managed to know so far is that we are very close, possibly, of a BRICS 10. At the moment, it's BRICS 5. The BRICS 10 will have uh, Argentina. Uh, this was Brazil's vote, essentially, among the five. Egypt, uh, Iran, Saudi Arabia, and the Emirates. And what does that tell us? This is extremely important. It tells us that the BRICS are more or less getting closer and closer with OPEC+. Plus. This is the energy angle, which in this case, geoeconomically is even more important than the geopolitical angle. But now we're going to have enormous producers of energy together sitting on the same table, including Russia, of course, Iran, Emirates, Saudi Arabia, Egypt, Russia, and soon we may have Venezuela as well. And, and in, the, in the second batch, why not Kazakhstan? You know, can you imagine what this means in terms of having between 60 and 70 percent of the major producers of oil and gas sitting on the same table on a geopolitical level, not only in an organization that is strictly business and energy business like OPEC Plus? This, this is the, I, I see this as the real game changer because 
what's going to happen afterwards, the second step? They're going to start to, uh, trading among themselves and with their customers in their local currencies, which is part and parcel of the discussions since yesterday in Johannesburg. How we're going to increase uh, trade in our currencies, uh, all of us five BRICS members, and if it's BRICS 10, the same thing will apply. So we're going to have dirham, we're going to have the Iranian real, all part of uh, these, uh, this uh, trade connectivity in local currencies. So I would say that the next 24 hours could be a game changer. Let, let's not have <laughs> too many high expectations, of course. We all do. But uh, if they dare, first of all, to publish the, for all, the whole world to see Okay, the procedures for ent for admission are that they're not very complicated. All the 23 of you who applied sooner or later will get in, and all 40 something of you who expressed interest, we're open to all of you. So soon we're gonna have BRICS 40, BRICS 45. Can you imagine that? It's 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 possible, but not this year, uh, George. I would say that uh, the consolidation I'm of I'm of already the imagining that we're it. living these days. You're already imagining it. I'm exactly. already imagining Fantastic. it. Fantastic. <laughs> with, with excitement. Pepe Escobar, it's been a privilege for all of us to see and hear you again this evening. Don't be a stranger. And My stay pleasure, in touch. George. Thank Pepe you. Pepe Escobar, how wonderful uh, character and so learned and so worldly wise. Should disaster stricken Hawaii secede from the United States? Yes or no you can vote almost up to the end of the show and you can also call me in the uk and ireland on 0808196552522 in the us and canada plus 18449443344 and in the rest of the world 442039662625 i'll be right back stay tuned Let's hear from Mehdi. Go ahead, sir. Hello, George. Thank you very much for taking my call. I, this is such an honor because one thing I want to tell you is in 2003, yeah. I thought that you, uh, I'll say it, I thought you were a prattling liberal idiot. 20 years later, I'm here honored to speak to you to say live on air, I'm sorry I should have listened to you back then. What I mean, Thank you're you. bringing the truth to what's going on out there. And one of the things is U.S. policy whatever it is now is our government the problem is is that it's run by people with absolutely no honor they have no shame in what they will do to accomplish what they want and i really think part of what's going on uh, that's driving what's going on in ukraine is that it it's the possibility of all the corruption um that it will uncover that has happened there with the influence of our co our country and NATO since 2014. Yeah, yeah, you spoke uh, extremely powerfully and very graciously, and I'm grateful for it. But you, you put your finger on, I think, something that been in the back of my mind for a while. I grew up in a time, indeed, I sat in parliament for almost 30 years during a time when there were certain standards that there were double standards, of course, and there was a great deal of hypocrisy, but the ruling elite had standards that they tried to keep up. Nowadays, that facade has been torn asunder. Now they're not even pretending to be honorable gentlemen and ladies. Now they're no longer pretending that their institution their great departments and ministries are in anything to do with contemporary politics other than an arm of the ruling party. My last word, Mehdi, I ain't no liberal, bruv. I wasn't back in 2003, and I ain't any more liberal today. You are listening to the mother of all talk shows with George Galloway.
Well, it's been quite the show, uh, an unexpected turn of events this afternoon, uh, the uh, death, the killing, I think we can say, of Prigozhin and his deputy on board their private jet flying from Moscow to St. Petersburg, shooting down of the plane or the plane being bombed in a terrorist act of sabotage, as yet we don't know. What we know from Pepe Escobar is that rumors are swirling wildly and not just, I'm sure, in Moscow, in Russia. Uh, now, we talked to Pepe about the uh, BRICS that's taking place in South Africa and very informative as I expected, we expected him to be. But let's hear from my good friend, and former colleague Ahmed Caballo and Clinton Nzala to get an African perspective on what's happening down in South Africa. Gentlemen, very good to see you. I don't know if you heard Pepe's, uh, well, I was going to say excited, but maybe a bit less excited than he had previously been uh, about the BRICS meeting so far. What's your own perspective on it? Yeah, I mean, the whole African continent is excited about BRICS. And we went to the streets of Johannesburg and we got some box pops and everyone was excited. Every taxi that we have drove in, the taxi drivers expressed their excitement. However, going to the event today and yesterday, um, the excitement has kind of died down a little bit because although BRICS is definitely needed and it's definitely the future because of the actions of the South African president Cyril Ramaphosa to not allow Putin to disinvite Putin from attending uh, in person I think it's put a bit of a downer on the whole event uh, today kind of Putin it seemed like he took a bit of a shot at Ramaphosa he said that you know, Russia will be hosting the next BRICS and Russia will make sure that it's independent and not, you know, uh, subject to external pressures. I'm not sure if he worded it exactly like that, but that was the gist. And um, it definitely felt like a dig. Then Ramaphosa said something back, mentioned the war in Ukraine and then said something like, as you said that you want this to end, you know, the you said part of it felt a bit targeted and, and, and telling in the tone. Um, and then we have President Modi, who seems to want to have one foot in the West's camp and one foot in BRICS's camp. You know, in his speech today, I think he mentioned the G20 um, in positive terms and then mentioned BRICS. And it's like, why are you mentioning G20 at a BRICS summit? I'm sure none of the G20 members are mentioning BRICS when they, when they meet. Uh, so, yeah, you know, there was positive comments from 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 uh, President Lula. Uh, the Chinese are obviously always reserved in their assessments. And Putin was, you know, no hold but no holds back bars and was denouncing the West for, you know, causing global insecurity through its sanction regime, through its wars, through its regime change program. But I just feel like there's two members, South Africa and India, that might potentially be letting the slide down. Is that how you saw it, Clinton? It certainly seemed uh, also to be the view of, uh, of Pepe Escobar. Is that how you two saw it? I definitely agree. I think uh, the best I can say, it has been lukewarm. Like a lot of people <laughs> ex expected decisive statements decisive postures from the leaders of the BRICS nations involved. Then I think for the past couple of months or weeks leading to the BRICS summit, I think President Ramaphosa has failed to show a backbone. Uh, the, today we are having four leaders at the uh, summit, uh, getting expectations of having five leaders. And many people, they think this is a result of President Ramaphosa failing to stand up to the bullying tactics of the West he failed to make it clear to say, as a host nation, all leaders of BRICS that were supposed to be in Johannesburg were going to travel to Johannesburg. So at one time, 
he had shown like he was willing to take a stand. He was willing to have President Putin here safe and secure. Then at one moment, he seemed to backtrack. So all this kind of affected, I think, just affected the mood of the, the summit. A lot of people, you know, BRICS is seen as an alternative. It's supposed to be a group of people who cannot be swayed around by some Western bullying or whatever, but it's, uh, President Ramaphosa has thought to show that. So generally, the whole conference is very lukewarm. And like uh, Ahmed yeah, pointed out to say, I was shocked when we had President, uh, Prime Minister Modi talking about how he India is going to help the African Union to get a seat uh, in the G20. Like at a BRICS summit, why are you going to be talking about the G20s? Like total and related. And I think that the reason why we've got groupings like uh, BRICS is because of members of the Global South seeing that uh, groups like G20 were not giving them the voice that they wanted. At the best, those were reduced to just talk shops. And if they were invited, they are ever invited, sometimes they do send out token invitations to certain countries from the Global South. But we know to say those countries there are not taken seriously. They are just treated like bridesmaids or, or escorting some people to their marital bliss. So I think that then organizations like BRICS, at least they give the Global South a voice. And it's a reason why right now a lot of uh, countries from the Global South have, have shown interest to join BRICS because they think that it's a platform where their aspirations and their developmental agendas, their political agendas are going to be hit. They are going to have a voice. And like places like where I've said uh, G20, which are merely beauty pageants that only help to maybe to try to sell capitalism to, to the global south. Ahmed, I'm so old, I knew a different Cyril Ramaphosa and a different uh, ANC for that matter. But whenever I make that point, uh, people refer me to a book called The Economic Hitman. And they imply uh, that uh, the economic hitmen uh, have got to Cyril and to the ANC and that they're not actually free agents to be what perhaps they would like to be, certainly what they would once uh, have liked to be. Is that just a cop-out or is there anything in that? Well, well Cyril Ramaphosa is the second richest black man in South Africa. He's a billionaire. Now, he has millions, maybe billions in offshore accounts, which means there's clearly a conflict of interest. You know, South Africa is the most unequal country in the world at the moment. Is a billionaire president the type to put in policies that are really going to empower the masses and redistribute the wealth, which was what the Freedom Charter and the struggle for liberation was all about. But that being said, you know, I'm very critical of the ANC. Um, and I think some of the points are valid, but there is two wings of the ANC and Ramaphosa clearly represents the moderate ring. If we look back to President Zuma, you know, who again, I'm not a big fan of, but if we look back to when the West put pressure on President Zuma with regard to the ICC arrest warrant of Omar al-Bashir, he says, do what you want to me, Bashir's coming and that's that. Now, um, you know, you know me, you know my family, we oppose the Bashir regime. But we think it's a principal position because the ICC, I think it was nicknamed by the Gaddafi, the International Caucasian Court, because it only goes after African leaders. It really loses all credibility when you look at the people that it goes after. So I'm not one of these Sudanese people that believes Bashir should be in the ICC, not because he's not a war criminal, because I just don't believe in the institution. I believe that, you know, if you're going to try uh, someone in a court that has no legitimacy on the continent, doesn't mean anything. It just looks like a, a, a Western instrument to go after African leaders. Um, but yeah, I mean, when we spoke to taxi drivers, it's the best way to get the feel of what people are saying on the ground. All of the taxi drivers feel that, that Ramaphosa has basically uh, lost his backbone. And it's not just that he disinvited Putin. If we think back, he did much worse than that. He made up this fake quote that there's no way the Russians ever said about if you dare arrest Putin, it will be a declaration of war. Now, because it was such a provocative thing to misquote an ally about, the Russians had to come back and say, we never said that. 
But it does go without saying that if you were to arrest any head of state, it would be a declaration of war. So I think it wasn't just, uh, you know, disinviting him. I think it was the comments afterwards that showed that he's not a reliable partner and maybe not, you know, the one that should be leading the African charge in the BRICS. Clinton, uh, what significance for Africa do you see in the death of Prigozhin uh, and his deputy in the plane crash in Moscow, outside Moscow today? Uh, Pepe's view was that it will make no difference. Russia will uh, play the same role in uh, Sahelian Africa as uh, it would have done if these events had not happened. Do you have any uh, views on that, any apprehensions? about that i think it all depends on how uh we not say wagner has got uh, quite a significant presence in the central african republic and the sahel where they've played a decisive role in ensuring that some normals and some stability returns to the region they've helped to turn the tide against attacks from insurgent groups in those regions so but after the, I don't know if I would call it an insurrection that we saw a few months ago, I think there were some configurations that were done regarding how the Wagner group operates in those regions. So I think due to those configurations, yes, of course, the impact is going to be there, but I feel to say it will be minimal. It will not be one that would disrupt the ongoing operations that Wagner has in the region, or maybe even, um, like, I don't think it would affect the security arrangements that are going there. It's a sad thing whenever someone dies, and it actually it's, it's very sad, but I think that the operations will continue in their current form. Ahmed, last word to you, and changing the subject necessarily short of time. Uh, the big struggle in Nigeria uh, must reach a conclusion sometime soon in the courts. Uh, the question of whether or not the current president of Nigeria was actually legally entitled to be on the ballot paper. And uh, I have uh, somewhat unexpectedly uh, emerged as someone in that, uh, um, that mix. Um, it's a strange thing that an African president is in court in Illinois trying to stop his university from releasing a copy of his uh, academic results. One can only assume that they don't make for good reading. What's your take on that? It is strange, unless you understand the, the, the ins and outs of US imperialism. He is the perfect candidate to do their bidding because it makes no sense a country like Nigeria that says one of the biggest tribes in Nigeria with the people of Niger shares one of the biggest land borders, shares a lot of culture, dress, especially between the north, to be attacking their neighbour over a coup in a continent that has dozens of coups that happen all the time and Nigeria doesn't do anything. So, you know, they need to have somebody that has this threat looming over them that we will you know charge you for this or we can take your money away from you or we can expose you and that's what gets them to do their bidding it's part of the book that you mentioned previously the economic hitman this is you know it's a it, i don't know what page it is in the cia handbook but it's definitely in there <laughs> fantastic thanks for uh, both of you appearing uh, i'm very glad to see you squeezed into the one frame i'm glad we were able to talk to both of you and i hope it isn't the last time either clinton and ahmed thanks for joining us on the mother of all talk shows uh, coming up after the break is the one and only lee camp and you don't need me to tell you that you don't want to miss that the poll uh, 18,313 people have so far voted I predicted this would be a 20,000 poll. Let's see if I'm right. Uh, and 92% say Hawaii should secede from the United States. That's on Telegram. 83% say so 
on Twitter, 86% on the YouTube community poll, and on the YouTube stream, 87%. So absolutely overwhelmingly on our poll, people say it should be whatever the opposite of aloha is in Hawaiian uh, between the, let's face it, annexed territory by the United States. No other way to properly describe it. And a measure of how the government in Washington thinks of the people in Hawaii was surely Joe Biden on a deck chair in Delaware before he was on a deck chair in Lake Tahoe, before he fell asleep because he'd been holidaying so hard in the previous couple of weeks. No one uh, can seriously believe that Washington cares about Hawaii. Uh, the wonderful uh, Lee Camp is coming up next, and I've got a little video to show him. In fact, let me play it now, because you thought Joe Biden was deck chair bound next to being wheelchair bound. But did you know he was in fact in the gym? Have we got that clip from earlier this evening? It is priceless. Watch this. There's not much that happens when the brush is not behind, but I don't know enough to know the answer. I've been working out for the last hour and a half. Will you watch the debates later? I'm going to try to see. There you go. Joe Biden had been working out for the previous hour and a half. And if you believe that, I've got a bridge here in London. I could sell you going cheap, cheap, cheap. I'll be right back. Stay tuned. You don't get to call me far right. You don't get to call me that on my own show. A lifelong socialist, the leader of a socialist party, the Workers' Party of Britain, with an Indonesian wife, with five mixed race children, with a record of fighting racism all of my life, representing more people of color in the British Parliament than anyone in history by a country mile. You don't get to call me far right. These kind of idiotic insults tossed around by infantile leftists who think that anyone to the right of them is a fascist, is a racist. They are the cause of the crashing and burning of what used to be called the left. They are the cause of it. They have discredited leftism with their foolish, idiot-isms and ists and smears that emanate from them like a bad smell. You are listening to the mother of all talk shows with George Galloway. Now, the last time I saw Lee Camp was in a temple of indeterminate religious ordination, but we had a great time together in Beijing, and he appeared on our now famous moats from Beijing, you may recall. Of course, I check him out every time I know that he's performing, and you should too. He's not just funny. He's not just a satirist of the highest rank. He's politically switched on to Lee Camp. Welcome back to the mother of all talk shows. On that point, you being you. A, a satirist, you, you'll soon be out of work because, I mean, real life could not be more satirically funny. <laughs> yeah. It, it does make my job kind of hard when uh, I, I feel like uh, reality is lapping satire. It is quite difficult when you have a president that falls asleep through every event. It, it, it does become harder and harder. Yeah, he was working out for, for 90 minutes. That's right. I, I think 
you know, really, it, it, he has to work out so much because uh, his presence, he's not working out. So he just claims he is. And, uh, you know, I, I imagine it probably involves a team of people trying to make sure his joints still function in one form or another. It's hard to believe that. Uh, I mean, maybe that's why he fell asleep in Hawaii. He'd been working out for an hour yeah. and a half uh, before it. An 80 year old man. Uh, by the way, Mick Jagger is also 80 years old. He's the same age as Joe Biden. Uh, but I doubt if he would fall asleep. Uh, but the, the slumber was significant, wasn't it? Because it came after 10 days, I think, certainly a week, of absolute neglect by the government in Washington. And when they did deliver aid to the people of Maui, it was less than those same people through their taxes, had just given in the latest tranche of aid to the Ukraine. How's that for equity? Yeah, what was it, $700 a house or something like that? It's it, it completely meaningless. Yeah. And, and let's remember that we have a military budget that's a trillion dollars a year. They could make every one of those people who lost their homes a millionaire and not even notice it on the on the Pentagon's budget uh, yeah, it, it is disgusting, the neglect, uh, how little Joe Biden has so-called achieved. But, you know, maybe this is a good thing for the American people to see that when the president is essentially meaningless, essentially just a, a, a sack of flesh falling asleep in every meeting, all the machines continue to run. And it actually shows how little the presidency kind of matters. You have the military industrial complex, the, the corporate America that is making most of these decisions uh, around the world and wreaking havoc. And the president is kind of like, you know, yeah, he makes a decision here or there or the people around him do, but it's, it's kind of meaningless. And maybe this is helping the American people wake up to, you know, a pun, I guess, unintended, wake up to how little the, 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 the presidency matters in the scope of things. The wars continue. The bombing continues. The, the, the disgrace that is our infrastructure in America remains the same. There's just so many levels that nothing changes, whether you have Biden falling asleep every three minutes or Donald Trump ranting and raving every three minutes. It doesn't seem to change. Well, uh, according to Biden, the economy is uh, doing very well uh, under the Democrats. The fact that your mortgage rate uh, is now 8% uh, in the United States, which presumably will cause a crash in the number of houses bought and the number of houses sold, because who's going to move from uh, the fixed term mortgage they're already on to an 8% mortgage on, on a new property? This is symptomatic, isn't it, of a deep malaise in the U.S. economy? Yeah, I mean, people are struggling horrifically. It's, I, I believe it's still two-thirds of America that say they live paycheck to paycheck. Um, you just had people thrown off of health care across the country, over four million people dumped off of uh, Medicaid by the Biden administration, and they don't know where they're going to get their health care coverage. You you have uh, people kicked off of food stamps. Um, it's just it, it again, these these presidencies are very similar. The, the, the Democrats talk a game as if they care about human beings and they don't. And people are struggling in just so many ways. There's over a trillion dollars of credit card debt. I mean, that's how people are surviving in the United States is putting more and more on credit cards to just try and cover basic necessities. That is not a bubbling economy. Now, uh, bubbling on another network, uh, I'm sure, is the donkey derby uh, uh, of the uh, putative candidates to fight against Joe Biden on Fox News, although it's Hamlet without the prince uh, because uh, the somewhat tawdry prince, Donald Trump, is elsewhere. We'll come to him in a minute, but tell us about the runners and riders on Fox News tonight. 
I mean, I can't even name them all. They're all running over 20 percent or whatever behind Donald Trump. I mean, there's obviously DeSantis is the big one, but I don't know. They're they're all competing for who can sound like the, the, the who can spit out the most lunacy. Uh, and it is all meaningless, as we've seen time and again, no matter what these people say, they all tend to do the same things in office, whether it's a Democrat or a Republican. They all, you know, Republicans try and act more right wing, Democrats try and act more left wing. And then when they get into office, nothing they said matters. So I don't know why people tune into these debates and act like what's being spoken is any kind of truth. Although one of them is really two men in disguise, isn't he? That fella, Chris Christie. I'm sure he's two men in the same suit. He very well might be. Is he the fattest be. man Let's... ever to run for office? <laughs> He might be. He, and let's remember, this is a guy who was, you know, kicked out of the governorship in, in New Jersey in within a scandal. And this is the best, you know, the, the Republicans, I mean, Democrats, too. But it's the best they have to show is apparently he's now the moral arbiter. That's how far we've sunk. The guy who left his governorship under massive scandal is now the moral arbiter of the Republican Party. <laughs> let's turn then to the prince. Uh, uh, he made uh, he made a big choice not to join the debates. Uh, he's so far ahead. You could see why he took that decision. And Tucker Carlson's definitely determined uh, to get his own back on Fox News. So their event is clashing directly uh, with the Fox News uh, debate. First of all, who will win the ratings war on that one? And what are you expecting from Carlson and Trump? Yeah, I bet you Trump probably wins the rating war. I mean, I don't like I don't like walking around. I live in Baltimore now walking around. I don't know if anybody even knows there's a Republican debate happening. I don't like I don't know if people are. Is, is anyone really tuning into this to this clown show? But. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm sure Trump will win that ratings war. And, you know, I think we can all we all kind of know what he's going to say. He did nothing wrong. He's the best president to ever live. He had a perfect phone call, all that stuff. I mean, it's funny because you have a, an incredibly corrupt con man going up against uh, the, the portion of the ruling elite that desperately want to stop him from winning the presidency again. And they're all, of course, corrupt and and in bed with the most horrific corporations in the world. And so you have the corrupt versus the corrupt. And, you know, these latest charges, I guess, are some of the most significant. But may maybe we'll get into that. Yeah, I mean, he's going to be arrested in in Georgia tomorrow. What for? Yeah, I, it seems like the 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 main charges are that they basically he and his he and his group put together a competing list of electors to claim that the, in certain states, including Georgia, he had won the state, and then send those electors to uh, Congress to put them forward as the actual people that would vote uh, for the president, which. To me, this is one of the one of the key things that and, and it, well, first of all, I'll say this. Is it a crime? I, I, yeah, I'd say likely it is. It probably absolutely is. He's corrupt. He he did everything he could to try and maintain his position as president. Um, but he's going against other corrupt people who are who are equally corrupt in different ways. Uh, but I'll say this, that that one of the things that is essentially not mentioned at all in this entire scandal, this whole idea of him putting to, putting together a competing electors is the whole elector system, the 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 electoral college is absolutely and horrifically undemocratic. These are people, the whole idea of the Electoral College was put forward initially in the United States in case the American people had the nerve to vote for someone that the ruling elite did not want. So basically you have this Electoral College, which is the final say in whether the American people got it right. And the Electoral College has put our president into office many times against the, uh, the popular vote, or at least a few times. So it's completely undemocratic system that Trump was trying to rig uh, for himself. But of course, that aspect of it, how horrifically undemocratic this is, not mentioned really on your mainstream media. 
No, uh, and just like the investigation into uh, the Bidens. I mean, I keep reading in the small subsection uh, of media that I uh, inhabit, uh, I keep reading that uh, actually they're discovering more and more information uh, about uh, the Bidens, the Biden crime family, including this, to my astonishment, Apparently, Joe Biden, the vice president of the United States, was sending emails to his son and his son's business associates under false names, under pseudonyms. I mean, we know about Hillary and her emails and all this, but if the, if the American people knew all this, surely there wouldn't even be a contest over whether Biden uh, gets reelected or not. Yeah, I think his pseudonyms were uh, Sleeping Beauty and uh, the Crypt Keeper or some of the names that he was using on email. No, <laughs> but uh, people should know that he was keeping contact about these dealings with his son, his son obviously on the board of that oil company in Ukraine, getting paid uh, you know, millions of dollars and setting up meetings we now know they had at least one meeting with one of the heads of this oil company in washington dc that biden was a part of and another part of this story is that you see our mainstream media i mean the main people reporting on this are the kind of right-wing outlets but you see all of the kind of liberal outlets like new york times washington post etc running in circles to try and justify the fact that they've gone years denying this story, denying the laptop was real, denying that uh, that you, that Biden had anything to do with this Ukraine oil company, even though he said publicly, of course, that he got the prosecutor fired who was looking into this company uh, in Ukraine. So it, it is amazing to see these so-called, you know, established legacy media outlets, the, the the gymnastics they're doing right now to try and make it seem like they haven't been running interference for the president of the United States this entire time. I mean, these are garbage outlets and it's really it's really showing right now. Tell us uh, about your next tour, uh, Lee. It's a great title. Not enough friends to bury a body. Who is that that doesn't have enough friends to bury a body? <laughs> That'd be me. But uh, yeah, I'm doing a live, uh, two live Zoom comedy shows. So anybody in the world can buy tickets. Uh, they're only five bucks and they're, it's at the top of my Twitter feed at Lee Camp. Uh, first time I've ever done this full new Zoom comedy show hour. And uh, I, I'm doing one of the shows at a time that's good for London folks as well because I didn't want you guys to be left out because of time zones. So September 2nd and 13th, and I really hope people check it out. I think it'll be a lot of fun. Keep a, keep a ticket for me, Lee. I'll definitely be in your audience. A pleasure, as always, remaking Absolutely, our acquaintance. Lee Camp, uh, satirist and comedian of the First Order. Uh, get your tickets for his Zoom Comedy Club. That's a new one and worth it. It's only five bucks. Should disaster-stricken Hawaii secede from the United States? Well, now 18,655 of you have spoken, and still it is overwhelmingly the opinion, at least of our audience, that Hawaii would be better off on its own. Here are the phone numbers. UK and Ireland, 08081 965522. That's 0808196522. You call us right now. And in the US and Canada, it's plus one eight four four nine four four double three double four. That's plus one eight four four nine four four double three double four. And in the rest of the world, four four two zero three nine double six two six two five. I'll be right back at your calls all the way to the end. As the green smoke rose, their faces flashed out pallid green and faded again 
as it vanished. Then slowly the hissing passed into a humming, into a long, loud, droning noise. Suddenly a humped shape rose out of the pit and the ghost of a beam of light seemed to flicker out after it. Forthwith, flashes of actual flame, a bright glare leaping from one to another, sprang from the scattered group of men. It was as if some invisible jet impinged upon them and flashed into white flame. It was as if each man were suddenly and momentarily turned to fire. That was me reading H.G. Wells' War of the Worlds. I was just trying to think, does anybody know what H.G. stood for? Give me your answers on social media. H.G. Wells' War of the Worlds, read by me on my Patreon. And I really want to ask you to support me on Patreon. It's patreon.com forward slash George Galloway. It will cost you less than the price of a cup of tea in an insalubrious cafe, and I really need your support. Some top comments from my uh, loyal patrons. Now, Armias A. Abebe, not a supporter of breaking up nations. Uh, if we go down this path, we'll end up with a thousand nations. We must exhaust all the options available to fix the system for better governance. That refers, of course, to our poll Hawaii. Uh, Jalal Sinjer says no person is under any obligation to be loyal to a government that offers them nothing in return. And Gildra says there are a lot of suspicious circumstances surrounding the fire. Indeed there are, as there was in Tenerife, as there was in Canada. There's a lot of arson out there. Makes you wonder, doesn't it? Paul MacDonald, another of my Generous Patreons says, the whole world should leave the United States to its pitiful demise. Great show as always, GG. Thank you, Paul, for everything. Ben, who is a Moats graduate, is one of the uh, strata that we have, says billions of dollars to Ukraine and thousands of dollars to Hawaii. I beg to differ only in this respect, Ben. It was $700 per household to the people of Hawaii. Thomas Sullivan says, who's the better chef, Obama's or Putin's? A very good question. So, uh, line one, David is in England, in Swindon, on Wagner. Go ahead, David. No, I, I spoke to your um, colleague there. I have two topics. I'd rather talk about Hawaii. If that's, if okay, that's okay, go on. Right, um, talk yeah. about University of Airways. Um, I've been listening to you for, I've spoken to you for the last couple of years, and I've done some education this afternoon for myself. I looked at Hawaii and I looked at the history, and what I'm going to talk about at the end, I'm, it will come to a tin of pineapple. Okay, for your people. Okay. In 1890, in 1890, there was a king in Hawaii. Yeah. He died. Yeah, I knew that. And the queen took over in about 1896. Queen Lilibeth, or something like that, yeah? Right. The, the American, Sounds familiar. Yeah, the, yeah, no. The American and English businessmen didn't like it because she was going to give the vote to the Hawaiian people. I, I read all this on, online. Okay? They didn't like it. So what they did, mm -hmm. this American and English businessman, they got the Marines to invade, and they held the Queen at gunpoint... Yeah, and she um, stepped aside. After that, they annexed. She a she Hawaii. abdicated. She abdicated at gunpoint. That's right, isn't it? I, I can't get anything over. I'm not going to get anything over. She abdicated at gunpoint. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. The people, the people, the British and the American businessmen who were interested in pineapple and sugar. Yeah, that was their main dollar and pound, whatever. Um, took over 
There's a guy that was installed as the commissioner for Hawaii, and his name was Dole, D-O-L-E. Now, if you look on any major wow. can of pineapple now, it's got the name Dole on it. Yeah. Really? And and that yeah. Intriguing. Say, really? I'll uh, I'll go and look. I'll go and look uh, when I got home in my kitchen cupboard. David, thanks uh, for that pineapple story. Uh, get your calls in and your emails on air at moats TV. John has emailed saying, "Evening, George. We could do with treating the Russians with a bit more respect. They saved our country from being part of the Reich." But our leadership seems to be delusion by provoking them, and for what exactly? As they know all about the 2014 operation to remove the elected leadership in Ukraine. Such a shame they don't teach the history of Russia's sacrifice. Amen to that, John. Aaron is in the U.S. in Minnesota on Wagner. Go ahead, Aaron. Yeah, Mr. Galloway, thanks for taking my call. I'm a 60-year-old. I'm a Welcome. military veteran. Uh, I originally supported the Iraq War. My first vote was for Ronald Reagan in 1984. And I've been voting Republican ever since. And when Trump came along, I was a big supporter. And after I saw all the things that happened in the last six years, we had the Russia collusion, we had the impeachment, then we had COVID, then we had the fake vaccine narrative, and then more impeachment. And... Uh, you know, I'm a patriot. I love my country, but uh, I'm very worried that uh, the end is near. And um, I think that with this BRICS thing going on, um, you know, if the dollar collapses, we're going to be able to stop killing people and stop stealing money, which is what we've been doing. And I, I started watching you about the time they fired Tucker Carlson, and I saw your speech at the Oxford Union. That was one of the greatest speeches I ever saw. And I've been watching you ever since. I haven't missed a, an episode. Well, I'm very glad yeah. to hear it, Aaron. Uh, what, what do you think of uh, the donkey derby, as I've described it, the other Republican candidates? Any of those runners and riders caught your attention? Or has Trump got the Republican nomination in the bag, even if he's in jail? Yeah, I think he's got it in the bag, and uh, I'm not going to watch the debate because I just don't support the legacy media anymore. But, you know, all the sound bites are going to be on a, a news loop for the next day, and I will watch uh, the Tucker Carlson interview. And uh, I just think that, uh, you know, the, the, the puzzle pieces are falling into place for world conflict, and that that's proof, you know, with West Africa. And, uh, you know... I'm I'm starting to be more open-minded about things, and I remember a caller talking to you about how Tucker Carlson could never be forgiven because he was an Iraq War supporter. And I just want everybody to know that we've all been lied to as much as the other side. I think Democrats and Republicans have both been lied to by you know this government. And so I've been listening to all the things that you're saying, and you know we have a lot of common ground. So I'm gonna keep I'm gonna keep listening, sir. Yeah, stay on the journey, Aaron, in Minnesota. Thanks very much for the call. YouTube comments now, there's plenty of them. Constance Aaron says, what was Prigozhin doing in Russia? He was exiled as part of the deal reached after his mutiny. Well, so they said, but who knows what is true and what is not true. Krohok says, if Putin wanted him gone, he could have had the plane halted at Moscow and had Prigozhin dragged off it and arrested. Uh, and Crowhawk goes on to say, I feel sorry for the pilots and crew who were just going to work and doing their job. Back to the phone lines, London and Eric on Trump. Not Eric Trump, but Eric on Trump. Go ahead, Eric. Oh, hello, George. Good evening. How are you keeping? You all right? By the grace of God, I'm fighting fit. Thank you. Go ahead. Yeah, no, thank you for your time, as always. Um, yes, I wanted to ask you, um, during your show in the past, you've often mentioned that Donald Trump would be um, a much better alternative than Biden, um, although you, you weren't a big fan of him, etc. And you said that, in all likelihood, if he gets in power, he'll be much more appeasing towards Putin, and there'll be less likely of the conflict to escalate. 
But I have to tell you, I'm not so sure about that because um, I had an interview with Piers Morgan. You know, he's been on his show many times. And he was saying, you know, that as good as his nuclear weapons are, ours are even better, and we've got much stronger ones. And, um, you know, we can fire off just as, as well as he can. And he said to uh, Piers Morgan, you know, I whispered something in his, in his ear once, and I said, blah, blah, blah. And Piers said, what did you say? He goes, I can't repeat it. But we can all gather that it was obviously something very threatening. So my question to you is, is that, you know, there is a chance he's going to get in, and if he does, I think he could cause just as much trouble as Biden is. Um, and that's a shame in a way, uh, but that, that's a likelihood. And that leads to my final point, if I may, that really I think the only way to solve all this, it doesn't matter if Kenny gets in or anyone else, because there's always going to be, at one stage of our lifetime, two psychotic leaders of, of the superpowers. Why hasn't anyone in your show or yourself mentioned anything about nuclear disarmament or CND? Surely the only way to save humanity is by total uh, nuclear disarmament. And I just wanted to see what you thought about that. Yeah, well, of course, but how are you going to get that? Uh, if, if we, I mean, does CND even uh, still exist? Uh, this would have been its moment if it existed. It could have been leafleting outside every cinema showing Oppenheimer uh, this weekend. But of course, they don't have enough people uh, to fill a telephone box. Uh, it is uh, the worst example I know of, although the Stop the War Coalition runs it uh, close, uh, of an organization that for its sectarian uh, and internal uh, political reasons has thrown away its brand, has deliberately uh, embarked upon a course uh, of actions which have steadily reduced its effectiveness in the case of CND to the point almost of literal invisibility. If I tell you, uh, I'm not uh, giving away any secrets, I've told you before, uh, the leader of CND refused to come on this show to advertise a CND event because of my stand on Brexit. Now, she's still the leader of CND in Stop the War. Uh, I have not appeared on a Stop the War platform for an entire decade. Not to worry, no to NATO, no to war. Its rival organization attracts uh, exponentially larger numbers of people uh, than they do. So like CND, the Stop the War Coalition has willfully destroyed itself by the pursuit of a tiny, narrow, sectarian uh, way of operating, a modus operandi. They cannot help themselves, these people. Now, these Members of leftist groupuscles have it in their DNA that they cannot get along with anybody who isn't exactly like them. And as the number of people who are exactly like them is mercifully tiny, they end up in tiny organizations. So, of course, I'm in favor of the destruction of nuclear weapons. But how are you going to get that? It's a totally utopian slogan uh, to advance at this point in time. I'm just trying to stop the weapons from being used at this point. And Joe Biden is infinitely almost more likely uh, to drag us into a nuclear confrontation with Russia uh, than, than Donald Trump is. The way you put it was not the way I put it. I never said I'd be delighted to see Donald Trump back in the White House. I did say I'd be delighted to see Joe Biden booted out of it. I would prefer him to be booted out of it by Robert Kennedy. But anybody will do. Vote Anybody but Biden, ABB, is my policy because my evaluation is that Joe Biden is the most 
dangerous man in the world. And he's senile. He wasn't working out for an hour and a half this evening. He was getting some kind of transfusion to keep him at least a half alive. And that makes him a very dangerous person indeed. Barbara is in Hawaii, so we must hear from her. Barbara, welcome to the show. Oh, hi. Sorry, I was just talking to my granddaughter in case I got a little forgetful. Yes, I'm here in Hawaii, and we support Hawaiian independence, even though we're not Native Hawaiians. We support them. And it was Queen Lily Kalani, and yes, it is dull pineapple. In fact, it was corporate interest that brought in the government. I think under McKinley, we have a high school named after in fact, my granddaughter's boyfriend goes to McKin- went to McKinley. They're both in college now. But... Um, Yes, it was overthrown, and the things in Maui are very sketchy. There are local videos and stuff, and they're on YouTube and other places where they're showing police that kept, and people testified, police kept people on Front Street, the main street in Lahaina, from moving while the fire was coming down the street and burning up their homes. And there seems to be clear effort on the part of corporations to to buy those homes when people are in distress and have nothing to fall back on for nothing so that they can develop them like they've done, you know, with Waikiki here on Oahu, where I live. The, the, other, the couple other things I want to say is I, that um, I, I'm, I'm 72. I have end-stage uh, ovarian cancer. Um, but in, I was, in 2008, I, I got more people registered to vote Democrat. I was an Obama delegate, precinct chair. I didn't vote. I voted for Jill Stein in 2012. I always voted Green before that, and I, yeah, I really thought he was different because he had one stand on Palestine that he never kept. And uh, I felt so sold out. I lost 164000 in my IRA and had to go on, on Medicaid and Medicare to survive because Obama gave that away. You know, and um, the same thing with Bernie. I, I gave him $1,000 out of my pittance that I was getting from Social Security that Biden has tried to destroy since he began. And um, and I worked my ass off on phone banks for both of them. And I feel like I got sold out by both. The only person I really trust is Cornell West. I hope that the Green Party gets a showing. And the other one thing I want to say, if, if I can make a wish, my wish is that Julian Assange get out of prison before I die. <laughs> that's all. And I really love well, that's you. A very, uh, watching you, and well, I wish you, I could support you. You. Say, I, I, you say that's all, uh, Barbara, uh, but it was enormously plentiful. Uh, in just a few minutes, you conveyed through your emotion and your eloquence the sense of betrayal that not only the people on Hawaii, but the Democratic voting base feels throughout the country. He was a fraud, Barack Obama. He, I mean, I walked in the street with Barack Obama in Washington on the eve of the Iraq war. He was a professor, and in his professorial way, he indicated he was just a local Chicago Paul then. He indicated a set of perspectives which, if he had even implemented a half of them, would have transformed the world, never mind transform America. And then when he came to office, Finance capital was on its belly, lying flat out on the floor in Wall Street. America was embroiled in never-ending wars. He could have ended war and financial depredation with a huge mandate behind him, but he turned into a creature of Wall Street, a creature of the military-industrial complex. And all the while he did it, looking good in a tan-colored suit and crooning Sam Cooke. It was all a lie. And now that the Democrats have turned into 
a man who goes to Hawaii and compares a kitchen fire in his house in which he worried that he was going to lose his pretty little green Corvette in the garage and his cat and he belatedly threw in his wife. He didn't lose any of them. He wasn't a part of an inferno. He had a chip pan fire that the fire brigade accused him of embellishing for political purposes. Joe Biden cannot speak without lying. He has been lying all of his life. And now that cameras record his every lie, which can then be exposed as a lie, sometimes within minutes, surely dooms him as a presidential candidate next year. I myself am convinced that this is all a game, that he cannot possibly run for president for another four-year term. Barbara, thank you. You really touched my heart. 19,253 people have voted. I was wrong. It didn't reach 20,000. And overwhelmingly, people say that disaster-stricken Hawaii should secede from the United States. Can you get me to 20,000 in the next 10 minutes? We'll see masses of YouTube comments tonight. Oliver Law, O2, says, Prigozhin wasn't so much of an aspiring bourgeoisie. He would have known that Comrade Stalin disliked traveling by airplanes and used mostly trains. And Melita Filter says, I am German. I disagreed with this country, joining NATO and all that came from it. No way should this country have participated in a war Again, God bless you, Melita. I hope you follow our Moats of Deutsch every Sunday just before my show. Our Moats show in German is becoming more and more popular. And Hirte Werk says, if you look at the crashed plane, the door was open already before it crashed. Otherwise, it would have been, and I can't read the next line, tantalizingly. It hasn't yet appeared on my computer. Uh, sorry, it has now. Otherwise, it would have been folded at the same point. The rest of the plane was folded in. There's a legend on the line. It's our professor from Florida. Simon in Florida is here to talk about Pakistan. Go ahead, Simon. Good evening, Mr. Galloway, and greetings to your audience. Um, there have been, on this very busy news day, some dramatic developments in Pakistan. Um, Mr. Imran Khan, the former prime minister, was having an appeal heard today before the Supreme Court of Pakistan, their highest judicial body. And whilst the judges seem to express some um, interest in the um, shortcomings of his previous trial, they decided to adjourn the hearing and allow the Islamabad High Court to hold its own separate hearing tomorrow, after which there will then be an additional Supreme Court hearing. Though it was very interesting that when the um, representatives for the government said that everything was being done by the book, one of the Supreme Court justices observed that Mr. Khan hadn't been presented before the court in his own appeal hearing. Now, the government, or rather the ministers of the previous government, have reacted very strongly to this, saying that it shows a, a clear bias towards the um, legal circumstances of Mr. Khan. But obviously one would expect them to say that because they are indeed most desperate that he is not released from prison on bail ending the final outcome of his appeal hearings, which would be regularly um, considered. So to that end, and this is quite extraordinary, a judge has agreed from the anti-terrorism court 
that despite the fact that Mr Khan is already serving an existing three-year prison sentence, that he may be arrested and transported by the police force in Lahore that has a joint task force investigating allegations of terrorism relating to Mr Khan from what is so-called the Sarwa incident. So it would appear that even if he were to be released by the Islamabad High Court or indeed subsequently by the Supreme Court of Pakistan, that he will already be under detention with another judge's order in another location relating to yet another of the over 150 cases against him. So it doesn't appear that he'll be seeing his freedom soon. That indeed was only signed today. And at the same time, you recall when I last spoke to you on your audience, we were talking about the constitutional crisis that had come about in relation to the president of Pakistan claiming that he had not signed the, arm, the new version of the Army Act and the Official Secrets Act. Well, just today, he's put out another public letter, quite extraordinary once again, stating that under Article 48 of the Pakistan Constitution, it is within his power to determine the date of the next general election within 90 days. And in no uncertain terms, he invited the head of the Pakistan Election Commission to attend his offices tomorrow in order that they could set a date certain, bearing in mind that representatives of that same organization just yesterday had indicated in the Pakistani media that not only were the elections going to be delayed until February of next year, but now they thought that May, an additional three months delay, was more likely. Extraordinary. I, I'm all for uh, exploring all of these legal uh, avenues, and heaven knows Pakistan has a labyrinth of uh, legal avenues. I'm all for it. But in the end, I think this million man march that the supporters of Imran Khan. Uh, are busily organizing will have much more effect than multiple uh, arrests and appeals against arrests and charges and appeals against those charges. Pakistan is expert at this labyrinthian, Byzantine system of courts and there's plenty of courts in Pakistan but not much in the way of justice. Thank you, Simon. In Florida, as always, Phil is in England, in Manchester, on Wagner. Go ahead, Phil. Hello, George. Um, thanks for taking the call. Uh, Welcome. Before, I'd just like to say, uh, I, I give up uh, what, uh, listening to the BBC and the rest of them like, a long time ago. What I do, I get my news for... Uh, um, nine o'clock on Wednesday and I get it out at seven o'clock on Sunday. That's all I watch now. I'm a musician. I've been a musician all my life. And uh, you've covered all the stories tonight, you and your guests, like quite brilliantly and like mostly answered uh, some of the questions. And I'm looking at all these tragedies, awful tragedies, and the way these people are answering to them to me, it seems like Monty Python's dustbin. I, I, I just cannot take them seriously at all. And it, uh, I, I feel that my intelligence is being insulted by the stories, what they're coming up with. What, what, what do you think, George? Well, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, you laugh or you cry. Uh, it, it, some of it is comic opera. Uh, there's no doubt about that. Uh, drama is, uh, is never ending. I, I sometimes have the feeling that the world is cascading uh, out of control, uh, that the people who seek to direct events maybe 
uh, have lost control uh, of them. Uh, I have uh, I have not set my hat against the possibility uh, that the Russians themselves, somebody in the organizations, even someone in the Kremlin, even Putin himself, I'm not setting my ha hat against that possibility. But in the balance of probabilities, I'm coming down against it because, first of all, Putin had no need to kill Prigozhin at all. He had no need to kill him now. He had no need to kill him in such a spectacular way at such collateral damage. He had no need to do so while the BRICS was in session in South Africa, where Russia's prestige is vital to the onward march of the BRICS. He could have arrested Prigozhin at any time. Or if he wanted him dead, he could have been shot at the airport. There was no need to let him take off and then fire a, a, a missile at him, filmed by people, the wreckage burning on the ground, the bodies being evacuated from the burning fuselage and so on. It just seems to me all unlikely. And so I'm assuming it was not an accident from the way that the airplane fell from the sky. And so, if my thesis is correct, Prigozhin and his deputy fell victim to a terrorist attack from abroad, which is bad enough for Russia, as I said. If abroad can blow up two such important people on an airplane that takes off from your capital, that's very, very bad news for Russia, even if they were not involved in the killing of Prigozhin. Look, coming up, it's the one and only Norma in Bristol. But first, it's a new caller, first time caller, Kai in Calgary, a place I know and love well on Ukraine. Kai, welcome. Hello. Yes, you're on the air. Go ahead. Okay. Um, yeah, I think the deep state did, uh, like, uh, killing two birds with one stone. They went after Russia, and the, the uh, German economic force is now wiped out. But the real reason, I think, with the substitute, uh, or that the, uh, China's policy, one road, one belt, is wiped out with the Ukraine now. Well, it's not wiped out, but of course, uh, Ukraine, uh, China did not want Ukraine as an enemy. Uh, nobody should have wanted Ukraine as an enemy. It could have been pulled in the direction of, of the BRICS, for example, and would have been a huge addition to it if the uh, government that was overthrown in 2014 had still been in power they would have been in South Africa today as candidate members of the BRICS. That's why they overthrew them, so they could pull the Ukraine with its uh, industrialized sector and its very rich agriculture and its uh, very strategic uh, south coast and the great city of Odessa, the great portal to the world represented uh, by that uh, part of Ukraine. So that's why they did it, Kai. I, that's I, what I to agree you. To I, I, I agree totally to you. What, I, what my point is, if America tried to shut down Chinese one belt, one road somewhere else, it'd be too obvious. Doing it this way, it's, it's, it looks different. You know, like that's not their goal. Yeah, great point. Give my love to Calgary. I've had many very, very happy days and nights there. Okay, look, the poll results are in. We didn't reach 20,000, so I have lost my wager. 19,431. 
and it is overwhelmingly the case that people believe Hawaii should leave the United States. Ah, look, take a look at these mugshots released by the Fulton County Sheriff's Office in the last few minutes. Take a look. There's quite a few famous people there, including the former mayor of New York City, Rudy Giuliani. I don't know if they're all under arrest or wanted. I just thought it was quite a distinguished wanted poster. Now, I should have cleared the line already because the legend, who's been poorly, is back. It's Norma in Bristol. Norma, a giant sigh of relief around the world from the audience <laughs> that, that you're well enough to talk. How are you feeling? Oh, I'm a lot better, George, but I haven't heard all your program tonight because my husband has been taken into hospital about an hour ago, so it's all been very traumatic. Oh, gosh. How, yeah, I know. I'm very sorry but to hear that. I so am I at the moment. I really am. Anyway, listen, I am not very happy about what you said about CND. I know you've got some very good points, but I wanted to point out there are three things they're doing in September. There's a big um, arms fair, and um, they've got an event on the 13th in London about the arms fair. And as you know, um, Jeremy Corbyn's the vice president. But there's an also a day of action on the 23rd of September, um, highlighting, highlighting, actually, the um, position of nuclear escalation. And the film Oppenheimer is being screened on Tuesday the 19th at 6.30. I wanted to say that they're not great. I've been a member for years, but they, we're not forgotten that they, they do try. That's all I wanted to say, George. Well, I, I, I'm, that's good news uh, to hear, Norma, but it is news. Uh, and I'm a person who, to say I'm a news addict, uh, would be a severe understatement. I'm a person who is absorbing information about events and counter-events, about actions and counter-actions all day long, every day, seven days a week, as my family can testify. Even when I'm at my dinner, I am absorbing what's going on in the country, in the world. So, the fact that it's news to me means that it must be news to the vast majority of our yep. audience. So mm -hmm. I appreciate your loyalty to the organization, and I'm genuinely okay. pleased about the actions that you describe. But the fact that nobody that I know knows about them no, I know. Is a very telling point, isn't it? Well, it is, yes, I know. And no. um, I would like much more publicity, but we, no, we don't get a lot. Though. No, uh, I, 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 you know, I, I don't want to repeat myself, but they could have had a friend in Moats. But how I voted on Brexit was more important than my stance on abolishing nuclear weapons, which I think speaks volumes about Kate Hudson, the General Secretary of CND. Uh, and I don't resile from anything that I said about them, notwithstanding Norma's helpful update about their continued activity. But activity in the dark where no one can see you and no one can hear you except those that have passed your ideological litmus test and voted the right way on Brexit from your point of view does not a mass movement against nuclear weapons make. I know because I have been in such a mass movement. I walked with the late and great General Secretary of CND, Monsignor Bruce Kent, all the way from 
Helensboro from Faslane, the nuclear weapons base in Scotland. I walked all the way with Bruce Kent to Bergfield, the American military base in the south of England, holding a public rally every night that was ram-packed with people, friends and foes. Julian Lewis, Sir Julian Lewis, then a foot soldier for the nuclear weapons camp, dogged us every step of the way and heckled us at every public meeting. I was on the mass demonstrations of hundreds of thousands of people organized by CND in the early 1980s against the sighting of cruise and Pershing missiles in Britain and throughout Europe. But now they won't even come on my show in which they can tell you what they're doing next week and the week after that because I voted for Brexit. That's where leftists are. Now that is the Nadir. And I've gone over my time again, but God willing, I'll be back on Sunday at 7 p.m. UK time with the mothership, with the Sunday edition of the mother of all talk shows. By then, things might be clearer in who killed Prigozhin, whose death today provoked the Metternich question, what did he mean by that? Good night.